close tonight. As we continue our study of the Holy Spirit, this evening we are uh, looking at spiritual gifts. We have looked at temporary uh, sign gifts, and then this evening we're starting with um, the permanent uh, gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. I invite you to take your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians in chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to begin with verse 1, and so I invite you when you get there, <clears throat> if you can, to stand for the reading of God's most precious and wonderful word. First Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gift of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. Our Heavenly Father, we do truly ask Thy richest blessing and guidance uh, as we study the Word of God. Uh, we know, Lord, that um, this uh, spiritual gifts is probably not spoken of as much or has not been in the past, uh, and then sometimes uh, in ways that uh, have not, we believe personally in our own hearts, uh, been uh, scriptural. Uh, but we, we need to understand and know the gifts and realize what a blessing it is that you don't just save us, but one of the things you do is gives us spiritual gifts. So we pray that you will bless your word to our hearts. We pray that you will guide and direct in, in our, the scripture and that uh, you will uh, edify God's people. And we praise you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Well, the Apostle Paul, as he's writing to the Corinthians, uh, was faced with the same problem that, we, that many have in the church today, and that is ignorance. Now, normally when we hear the word ignorance, we get a little offended. Uh, but uh, ignorance is not a bad word. It just means you don't, uh, you don't happen to know something. Uh, and so the issue is of spiritual gifts. Uh, he says here very clearly, he says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant. Uh, there's a few other times when he does say the same thing in scriptures. Uh, he doesn't want us to be ignorant of something. So this was a problem in the church. Now the church in Corinth, as far as we could tell, had a lot of spiritual gifts, but they, had, they were ignorant uh, of the guidelines and the uh, teaching on the spiritual gift. And so he was dealing with a subject, uh, as I said, which were they were ignorant about. And he wanted to dispel that existing ignorance, and that's what we should always want to do. Uh, there are going to be areas that we're going to be ignorant of, and we want to be able to dispel that and to teach God's Word clearly. <coughs> now, Scripture presents to us the fact that a part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is the giving of spiritual gifts 
to each and every believer. Everybody who gets saved receives at least one or more spiritual gifts. And those gifts are to be used primarily uh, for the edification, for the ministry to the body of Christ. But there are some that uh, go beyond that. And, and they're to be used not only in the body of Christ, but they're to be used outside, uh, reaching out to the lost as well. Uh, now, we know that there are people uh, who have uh, gifts and talents. Now, we're not talking about that type of gift, but talents, abilities. Uh, some of them are natural abilities, natural talents, and others uh, are ones they have developed. Uh, and uh, there are folks who just are able to do certain things uh, in incredible ways. Uh, I can remember when I was growing up, my mother was very, very strong uh, in uh, classical music. Uh, it was, uh, to me, to this day, a great blessing. Uh, this was the beginnings of stereo. Uh, my mother actually had a stereo system built for her, uh, speakers actually built. You should imagine, if you see her speakers today, uh, her speakers uh, stood about yay tall. There were huge things like this, and then there was another one on top. Uh, she had these four. Uh, she had a, a turntable. She had a, an Ampex uh, tape player. Uh, she had uh, uh, separate amplifiers, she had separate tuners, I mean the whole thing, and she had this huge cabinet. Uh, now we lived in the desert, and we had a beautiful fireplace in the front room, uh, which was probably used once a year. Uh, and so she had this cabinet built, and it went in front of the fireplace, and so for years we never saw the opening to the fireplace. In that cabinet was 500 long plane records. Wow. Classical, semi-classical, and two Elvis Presleys. Oh. <laughs> and uh, an easy listening. And I, I grew up in a home with beautiful, beautiful music. Uh, it was a, a wonderful um, blessing to hear it. And, and over the years, I can remember, for instance, my mother loved to play uh, records by Van Cliburn. Uh, there was somebody in our family, I'm not sure who it was, who either lived upstairs or downstairs from him when he was growing up uh, in, the, in an apartment building and would hear them. And so that no, information was passed on to our family and our family uh, would always talk about Van Cliburn, and so we often listened to his piano playing, and it was, it was fantastic. It was really something. Uh, but so many others, and, and since then, you know, the, uh, the privilege of continuing to listen. I, we've lost all those records. That, uh, that, that has always saddened me. Uh, my, my son, I don't know if he still is, but he uh, um, can't remember what the, we call you guys now, that uh, he loves uh, vinyl records. You know, he didn't really, he grew up with them, we had them. We began to get cassettes and, you know, and eventually now we're in the CDs and, and uh, so many are, are even beyond CDs, you know. Oh, by the way, I was in the midst of eight tracks. Uh, I don't think those were ever very good, uh, but just beautiful music. And, and, it, and as I think about that, I think of musicians who uh, have extraordinary abilities. Uh, not everybody has that. Uh, it, people who have spent a lifetime playing and learning an instrument, uh, only some accelerate. And, and we think of those things. And, but when we're talking about spiritual gifts, this is something totally different. This isn't the same. Uh, those are natural abilities or those are abilities that, uh, that uh, a person has developed. Like I mentioned again, Van Cliburn, he, he practiced, they, my family said, for hours and hours and hours and hours every single day. Uh, 
hopefully the music was good enough that uh, the rest of the neighbors, you know, weren't driven nuts by it. Uh, thankfully, he, he wasn't, uh, didn't play the cymbals. But, uh, but then, on the other hand, there are spiritual gifts, and these are specific gifts that God gives to his, every believer, at least one. And he gives them to us according to his will, according to what he wants to give, who he wants to give them to. They, there's no, to me, there's no rhyme or reason at times. Uh, but God has a rhyme or reason. God knows what he's doing. And uh, I, I've always said that when I get to heaven, uh, I do have some questions. And, uh, and, and one of them is, this, is, is really about the whole thing of gifts. I think when we see the Lord, I think it'll be so clear we won't have to ask questions. But, you know, in, in our humanity, we, we have that thought. So what I want to do beginning is actually turning to Ephesians and chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Here, uh, Paul tells us not only of spiritual gifts, but of spiritual uh, gifted men. Uh, and uh, if you'll notice, go down with me to verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Speaking of the Lord, it says, He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Uh, and we have already talked about the apostles. We talked about uh, the prophets. We told, uh, taught you how that they were temporary sign gifts. They were necessary for the beginnings of the church. Uh, they have now passed on. Uh, but there are others here uh, that have not. They are still uh, active and they are still very necessary for uh, the church. And the first one we see here is evangelist. And so there is a gift of evangelism, if I could put it that way. I also believe that uh, it, we could also maybe say that uh, that is a gift of, of being a missionary. Oftentimes a missionary may spend years and years and years simply doing evangelism uh, and maybe uh, never or hardly ever coming to the place where he uh, becomes an actually a pastor uh, because uh, trying to reach uh, the lost in some area. Uh, but uh, basically, evangelism. Uh, for the proclamation of the gospel, it is very important that we get the gospel out, that one takes the word of God and shares this with the unsaved. And there are some who God has gifted in, in his very special way, in order to do that. Now, the Bible teaches us that all of us are be witnesses. Every one of us is to go out and take the gospel and share it with others in many different ways. We may do it by handing out a tract. We may do it by uh, visiting somebody or calling somebody on the phone or writing a letter, different ways like that. We're all supposed to be uh, do witnessing but there is this special gift of evangelism. And this is taking the gospel to the unsaved. Uh, <clears throat> now, the message the, the, of the gospel, the evangelist ministry, is an itinerant one. We see this as an example with Paul. The apostle Paul uh, would go to an area he would begin to evangelize. He would normally, when he first started, he would go to a synagogue. He was Jewish, uh, and he would go to a synagogue, and he would begin to share from the Old Testament uh, those in the synagogue during a service. Uh, he would begin to share Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Here's what the Bible says, uh, and he, he, I'm sure, would go to Isaiah and other places and show them that Jesus fulfilled all of those prophecies, and he would then present the gospel to them. Now, uh, we are told, for instance, that um, uh, he sometimes would be in a place for up to two years. Uh, we know that in uh, Acts chapter 19 and verse 10, Luke wrote that uh, Paul's ministry in Ephesus continued for two years. 
So he was there for two years. Uh, but most of the time he wasn't in a place for that long. As a matter of fact, uh, in Thessalonica he was only there for about three weeks. In Berea he was only there for a couple of days. Uh, so apparently <coughs> uh, he, his, his timing would, would be different. <coughs> we experience today in, in our evangelism uh, kind of what we, uh, I, I guess a lot of it depends on our churches and the time and everything. There was a time in our country that evangelistic meetings would last for months. Uh, there was uh, an evangelist uh, up in the um, northeastern part of the United States, uh, more close to, to New York and and Pennsylvania and some of those areas, uh, an evangelist by the name of Asit Nettleton. Asit Nettleton would, uh, by the way, is very not very well known. Uh, he would go to a church and he would preach uh, Sunday after Sunday, week after week. He preached on one thing, you're lost. And uh, he, he sometimes would do that for a few months and he was often asked why, and he said, because they've got to get lost before we can get them saved. And then he would finally get to the place, he began to preach the gospel, and people would begin to get saved, not just in the church, but in the surrounding areas. Uh, they have gone back in, uh, historically in, uh, <clears throat> many years ago, this happened in the 1800s, and they saw that his convert, the average convert from his meetings, lasted up to 30 years. That was a period that they had done. Now, there were other evangelists at the same time, uh, and they held long meetings as well. Uh, Charles Finney was one of them. Uh, Charles Finney would go in and immediately begin to just simply preach the gospel, uh, preach about Christ, uh, and he had uh, large meetings. <coughs> in fact, in Rochester, New York, uh, he had a meeting, I think there at that time was about 20,000 people in the city of Rochester, a thousand people came to know the Lord. But when they went back and looked at his ministry, many years be later, uh, throughout all of New York and some of Ohio and stuff, almost no one was found. Almost no one. So sometimes they're long, but I share that with you to tell you that the meetings were long. When I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior, uh, it was in Southern California, uh, in Canoga Park. They were in the midst of a month of revival meetings, of evangelism, a month. Now we all sit here and go like, a little more than three days is a little bit hard for us. But <clears throat> a month, uh, evangelist uh, Glenn Shunk, was there. He was there for two weeks. <clears throat> he then, the church supported him financially. He went down to Simi Valley, which in those days uh, was almost nothing there. And uh, he went there and uh, in a small church and he preached for a whole week. And the church there in Canoga Park gave him the support so he could do that. Uh, in between that was when I was invited to church. And uh, I uh, didn't hear him preach at first. Uh, I heard the pastor preach and came to know the Lord. And then he came back from the church and he preached the next week. And I sat through that last week of meetings. Uh, now, most evangelistic meetings last about three days. They start on a Sunday. Uh, sometimes four days, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then they end. Uh, for a very long time, we, we did have them for at least a week. Uh, but that has changed. Uh, it's changed for a lot of reasons, and we can go into that, and it's not necessary. But uh, these are men who God has given the gift of evangelism. Uh, now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have to go and hold meetings. 
I believe there are those who are given the gift of evangelism that uh, are able to go out and uh, they're uh, able to reach more people uh, than the average uh, Christian is uh, and, and really reach them. I'm not talking about just going out and, and uh, talking to somebody and say, do you know you're a sinner? Yes. Uh, do you know Jesus died for you? Yes. Uh, do you want to go to hell? No. You want to go to heaven? Yes. You want to accept Jesus as your Savior? Yes. Well, let's pray. God save me. Let's write that one down. It's not that kind of a thing. It's, it's, it's individuals who God has gifted who go out and minister the Word of God, leading souls to Christ. Uh, but primarily, we would look at it as either uh, an itinerant ministry, going out, uh, going place to place as God leads, uh, or uh, as, as our missionaries go out and uh, do that kind of a ministry as well. Um, <clears throat> so their, their primary calling is to take the gospel to different areas. Now, let me just say as we're talking about this, um, we, we hold, oftentimes we say we're going to hold a revival. We haven't the slightest idea if we're going to have a revival. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what it's going to do. Uh, revivals, by the way, are to take place in the body of Christ. Uh, you can't revive something that's dead. Revival isn't for the unsaved. Revival is for the church. I do believe there are evangelists that God will bring in uh, that will uh, can be used by God uh, for revival. And we, we, we see that at times. Uh, special meetings, evangelistic meetings, is a different thing. And uh, that's for often what we can, uh, we can do, and we do. We, we, try, we do that just about every single year. We didn't do it for a few years because of COVID, but we're back doing that again. And in the spring, we're going to have uh, evangelist Ron DeGard back with us, Lord willing, and we're looking forward to that, that week of uh, him being here, and he'll be down in, in San Pablo, and, and I'm not sure where else, but you know, we, it, it, we have to have a lot of churches uh, to, uh, to have meetings with him because he's coming from the East Coast. Um, a lot of evangelists don't come out here. Uh, this, is a, this is a far, uh, a far trek, and so here we are. But praise the Lord for that ministry. So that's one gift. The second one is found here in the same passage. If you'll notice, he says prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers. Now, the word pastor simply means a shepherd. That's what the word means. And so the gift of pastor involves leading providing and caring for and protecting a portion of the flock of God that is committed to their care because that is what a shepherd does. Now, it's interesting that uh, <clears throat> here in Ephesians in chapter uh, 4 and verse 11, the word pastor and teacher uh, looks like it's talking to about two separate things. And I do believe there is a a, a gift of teaching, which we'll talk about, but the and is not there. Uh, the, the Greek word that is used there is different. It gives the sense that it is a pastor teacher. So we could almost put a hyphen there and say pastor teacher. Um, now, the pastor teacher's duty uh, is also uh, we're found in, in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, that he also has a responsibility of ruling in the flock of God. Uh, Paul told the Ephesian elders before he left them, he said this, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And in chapter 20, verse 17, and then also verse 28, three words are used. Elders, bishop, and pastor. But they're all describing the same person, but they're describing 
the different responsibilities that they have. Uh, and so the pastor is uh, the spiritual leader in the body of Christ, uh, and he is to lead the body. He is to also minister to the body. He's the shepherd the body. Uh, <clears throat> and I think it's very uh, significant that the pastor, teacher are connected here. Uh, it is vital, I believe, that the pastor is also a teacher. I believe that that's what God is telling us. Uh, now, when we look at teacher, gift of teaching, you can have that gift without being a pastor. But I don't believe you can have the gift of being a pastor without having the gift of teaching. Uh, the pastor's primarily number one ministry responsibility is to teach the body of Christ. Uh, that's what he's there for. That's what he should be doing. And if he's not teaching the body of Christ, and by the way, teaching them God's word and God's truth, then he's not doing the work that God has called him to. Uh, <clears throat> we are to feed the flock of God. He's not an organizer, uh, a promoter, a social leader. He gives himself to the preaching and to the teaching of the Word of God. And so we have the second gift, the gift of pastor or pastor-teacher. The third gift is mentioned here and in other places. For instance, if you'll turn back to Romans and uh, let's go to chapter 12. I think it's uh, interesting that when we, uh, when somebody did the dividing up of the chapters, because remember, your Bibles were not divided into chapters, all right? Uh, you, you had a letter that was sent, and it was just this letter, short or long, and then eventually uh, somebody came along and divided it up into verses and into chapters and, and that type of thing. <clears throat> but it's kind of helpful, I think, that the two major places in Scripture that talks about spiritual gifts is Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So that's easy to remember. So we have those two places. Now in Romans chapter 12, if you'll notice down at verse 7, <clears throat> here Paul says, or ministry, let us use it in our ministry, he who teaches in teaching. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 28, we read, And God has appointed those, uh, these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teaching. After that, miracles, gifts of healing, helps, administrations, various, uh, si uh, um, various uh, tongues, the varieties of them. And then, of course, in Ephesians, we have... Uh, again, where it says that he is given the pastor teacher. Teaching is the God given ability to explain the harmony and the details of God's revelation. All right? To be able to teach God's people uh, God's truth. Um, it's a gift that's sometimes given alone, I believe, and at other times it is given alone along with the gift of pastor. Uh, I, I think many times uh, uh, Christian colleges and universities and Bible schools and stuff like that will have gifted men who are gifted by the Holy Spirit to teach, teaching the Bible. Uh, and uh, sometimes these men will also be pastors, uh, other times they're not. They, their ministry really is just in, in teaching. Uh, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 7, or ministry, let us use our ministry. Uh, he who teaches in teaching. So, we have the pastor teacher. We also have the gift of teaching. And I do believe this is a gift that can also be developed. I think that we see that. You remember, uh, you may not been thought about this, but uh, in 2 Peter, which we haven't gone into yet, but uh, in 2 Peter, uh, Peter mentions the fact that he had read what Paul had written. 
He is very interesting there because he calls it scripture. Uh, but uh, also, uh, he must have taken time to study uh, Paul's writing uh, in order to teach them. And so he would have uh, used the gift, I believe he had the gift, but also that he uh, had to, he uh, used it and enhanced it and studied to be able to do the best job he can. And so um, we do all that we can. Uh, the, the pastors, the original pastors, would teach others. Uh, they would teach men uh, how to teach uh, the Word of God, uh, how to preach the Word, if they felt that they were called and had those gifts. And so it's not just something that we just uh, have that, but... Uh, that it can be enhanced. Now, being a teacher, having to gift the teaching does not mean that the person has a superior knowledge uh, of the truth. Uh, that's the uh, prophetic gift. God used the prophet to bring a specific message that he gave to that prophet. Um, this is different. This is uh, helping uh, uh, God's people understand the truth and be taught by the Spirit. It, uh, it deals with explaining and the application of God's truth. Again, uh, I want you to notice here in Ephesians in chapter 4, I hope you're there. You notice in verse 11, he says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors, teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Uh, I know you've already heard me say at other times, uh, that is not the pastor's, then he's to do the work of the ministry. He's there to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Ministry is a gift. Again, let's go back to Romans and chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, going again, let's go down to verse 7. Here we're told, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Uh, he goes on and he tells us these different ones that they have. They're given for the profit of all. Spiritual gifts are given that we might profit everybody in the body of Christ. For all of our profit. And then in 1 Corinthians in chapter 12, In verse 28. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healings, helps, administrations, and varieties of tongues. Uh, the gift here is, is mentioned uh, as, as helps, uh, ministering and helps, the same idea there. Ministering simply means this, serving. Uh, the gift of ministering is the gift of helping or serving in the broadest sense of the word. Uh, all Christians, by the way, have some ability to minister and help others. All of us do. Uh, the distinction within the gift may, may vary. Different individuals have uh, different abilities in different areas to be able to minister. Uh, the task of the church really would be impossible without this gift. Uh, it is vital. And, and I, in, in one sense, uh, maybe all of God's people have that gift. It needs to be exercised, but we all have that responsibility. We're all to help somehow. Uh, the, the sad thing that is happening so often uh, is, is we see so many who are sitting and not doing anything. 
Uh, and that the, the larger the church, the more that happens. It just, it just keeps on happening more and more. Uh, years ago, we had an interesting thing that took place uh, in our ministry back in Ohio. Uh, the church had been growing and everything, and then we had uh, some uh, difficulties that came along for a whole year, and uh, there came a split in the church. Uh, we lost uh, a lot of people and uh, a lot of positions, and uh, it was depressing. It was very, very difficult to go through. And it was not just difficult for me, it was difficult for the whole congregation. Uh, we felt like somebody had pulled our arms and legs off uh, because there were school teachers, there was sort of superintendent, there were deacons, there was you know, all these different individuals uh, who were doing different ministry, choir director, all of this. Uh, and, and here the church is, and what are they going to do? And, for a while, to be honest with you, we just were, we weren't drifting along, but we were just kind of, uh, you know, we were like in a rowboat and, and uh, we were trying to, to row upstream uh, and we just seemed to be going backwards uh, and it was a struggle. I thank the Lord at some point, I don't know, I don't know when this was, I don't remember, but uh, I remember uh, one of our one of our uh, men uh, uh, said, you know, we still need to have a vacation Bible school. Uh, almost everybody who had been running the vacation Bible school was gone. And uh, he said, I think we can just still do it. I just thank the Lord for those in the body of Christ who come forth and, and uh, you know, kind of have to push pastor a little bit, you know, and encourage him. And, and so uh, we did. And then but I started to think, well, who's going to do this? And then I began to sit down and I began to write down what each person in the church began to do on their own. And it was amazing. I had this whole sheet typed out. And it was such a blessing. Now you can imagine, we lost like 45 people. And you know, it was, it was incredible. And yet, all of these people stepped forward on their own and just began to minister in different places and, and doing the things and picking up the slack and, and stuff like that. It so thrilled me, I made copies for everybody. Because no one was really, we weren't recognizing it. We weren't seeing what had happened. Now, I, I would not recommend a split. Uh, I, I, I would rather not have gone through it. I would have rather we'd gone on and, and continue to grow. And th but it does happen. And, and at least one of the blessings was that many of the people in the church who were left began to do things that they felt they couldn't do. They looked at these others and they said, well, I can't teach like that one. I can't lead the songs like that one. And I can't do this and I can't do that. And they were sitting back and they were, they were almost oppressed. And then there was, who's going to do it? And God worked in their hearts and they began to, to serve and to minister. And it was beautiful. It was a beautiful, beautiful thing. I remember in, I think it was June, we had an evangelist come. Kind of an interesting thing, I'll just touch on this for a moment. His name was Bill Hall. And many years before, Bill Hall had held meetings uh, for a church that I was a, a youth director and a song leader in. Now, I think I've told you that uh, when I was, uh, you know, I was adopted, after my mother died, I found a little piece of paper that said that my name was William Hall, Jr. And, and I was leading the songs, and you know, it, it's funny how things will hit you, but in the middle of one of the songs, this thought came to my mind. And, and, and in the middle of the song, you know, we stopped one of the stanzas, I stopped and I turned to Bill Hall, and uh, our platform was really narrow. I mean, if I would take one step back, I stepped on somebody's toes behind me, because the evangelist was here and the pastor was here. And, uh, and I turned to Bill Hall and I said, Brother, did you know that you and I were born with the same name? <laughs> 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 
And he looked at me, <laughs> and finally he said, you sure do spell it differently. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> we had had scheduled Bill Hall to come uh, after this, this split and everything, and he came, and you know, later as, as we had the week together, and he stayed with us, and uh, him and his wife, and we just had a wonderful, wonderful time. What a blessing it was. And, and he, he, he commented on the fact of how uh, the church was doing and, and all that stuff, and then I had to tell him what had happened. He didn't see that because the body of Christ was all ministering. Everybody in that church was doing some kind of ministry. Every one of them. And by the way, ministry isn't just, this isn't ministry, this is, it's out here. That's where the ministry is. All the things. I think of, uh, you know, those who were ministering last night. Those who were ministering before last night. Those who minister afterwards, that is, that is part of ministry. Uh, and so in Romans, it talks about the gift of ministry. And in 1 Corinthians, it talks about the gift of helps. Uh, and the Ephesians were told that other gifts are given for the purpose of helping believers to be able to serve. And it's a basic gift, uh, and it is something that all of God's people can and should be doing one way or the other. And, and it's just that, Lord, I want to serve. Lord, I want you to use me. What would you have me to do? And God will open the door. God will show you. He does that. Well, let's stop there. Uh, we have many other gifts to look at, uh, but we'll, we'll stop there tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you and praise you for the work of the Holy Spirit and the work that he does in our lives including giving us spiritual gifts. I so thank you, Heavenly Father, for those who have the gift of ministering, serving one another. And I, I pray, Lord, that uh, all of us as a body of believers will seek uh, to serve in the way you would have us to, whatever it might be. I know, Lord, many of them we will never maybe be aware of or see publicly but they're still ministering. And I thank you for that. And I pray your blessing in Christ's precious name. Amen.